So a billion transactions last month of Bitcoin, and we see that there's definitely a couple of camps as it relates to how Bitcoin sh should evolve and how it can be used. Again, if you could take your conversations towards the back, please, that would be great. Thank you. So I think it's always great not only to hear the technical conversations as it relates to the topics that are on stage, but to also see what some real-time use cases are. And I'm sure a lot of people in the room did not know that one of the biggest and first Bitcoin art projects in the form of ordinals landed on the moon in February, February 22nd, actually. And that project was comprised of 222 artists selected globally to have their art inscribed on Bitcoin and preserved over a billion years on the moon. And I'm excited to say that I was one of those artists Yay, that has my fashion design in the form of art as an ornal on the moon. And that was with that historic moon launch from NASA back in February. So it's always good to hear use cases on top of what is the conversation, what is the controversy as it relates to these topics. So are you guys still awake? Are you guys still with me? Are you still having a good time, enjoying the conversations and discussions? Well, we are waiting for our next set of speakers. And in the meantime, who is siding with the old, the old G Bitcoin camp? Let it just, it should be pure, no L2s. Raise your hand. Who's on the side of the OG Bitcoin camp? No? Everyone wants to see it evolve? More layer twos? Reaching 100 maybe within the next year. Are we good? All right. So let's welcome our next group of speakers to the stage. They'll be talking about navigating international crypto laws. And I would like to welcome Inbar Price to the stage. And she is with DL News, and she'll be moderating today's panel. Can we give her a round of applause, please? I next would love to welcome Francois Valpoet to the stage of Chain Analysis. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Peter Grostkoff, please join us on stage. Unstoppable Finance. Lee Schneider, welcome to the stage of Ava Labs. dance here. And Michael Cho Chobanian, please welcome to the stage. And Michael's with Cluna Exchange. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, good morning. And for some of us, welcome to Paris. Um, uh, we're going to start with talking about policy and regulation um, for crypto, I think that you know policy and regulation around the world determines how users are able to interact with crypto, use crypto, and um, engage with Web3. On the other hand, it's also shaping the way the tech is being built. Um, I think you know we're also digesting the kind of more macro political landscape shifts with the EU elections just wrapping up yesterday and. This is an election year in 2024 more generally. So we're going to touch about a lot of topics, but the main thing I want to talk about is how are tech providers impacted by regulations and how, how should tech providers also prepare. Um, but maybe we can start first with an uh, introduction round, if everyone can just take a moment to introduce themselves and, um, yeah, what, you, what you're up to here. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm Francois. I'm the general manager for Chainalysis in France. Israel and uh, French-speaking uh, countries in Africa. At Chainalysis, we are a company specialized in blockchain analysis, blockchain data. We are analyzing, combining 
on-chain raw data with uh, open source intelligence and all our network of people in order to identify re real world uh, entities and uh, map their activity on the blockchain to help uh, our customers, which could be gov agencies, banks, uh, all the people who need to pay attention to cryptocurrency uh, transaction and to monitor and evaluate their risk uh, toward this activity. We mix the microphones a little bit. Um, hi, I'm Peter. I'm CTO at Unstoppable Finance and now uh, also co-CEO at Iron. So what are we doing? So uh, before we were, build, we were building Ultimate, which was the third most used uh, Solana wallet, um, kind of non-custodial wallet for the, for the masses that made it very easy to, to use DeFi. Um, with Iron, we're doing something completely different. Um, so we're currently founding a bank. Um, and it, in the end, it's a bank which is completely built on the blockchain. Um, so what do we believe that this is possible? So first of all, so we know a lot about banking. So um, I was co-founder and CTO at Solaris Bank uh, back in the days, so kind of nine, nine years ago, uh, the first uh, fintech startup in Germany that got a banking license and got into crypto also already six, seven years ago. And um, so we are very keen that um, in the end we can build a bank that kind of like keeps all deposits and so on in form of a token. And uh, for doing this, we're also building an uh, institutional grade um, chain technology that's, uh, that's able to be compliant and uh, run all this stuff. Uh, so who wants to know more about it can definitely talk to me later. And uh, yeah, so I'm uh, originally a tech guy, uh, but uh, who's now sitting on stages and talking about law. Hi, I'm Lee Schneider. I'm the general counsel at Ava Labs. We work on the Avalanche public blockchain. We are a software company, and uh, we do many different software things, including custom blockchain implementations for all different kinds of companies and people. I'm a lawyer talking about the law. I'm Michael Shivanian. I'm not a lawyer. I, I have uh, nothing to do with the law. Um, in a good way, in a good way, yes. I, I can break them sometimes, but um, I guess that applies to most of us. Uh, originally, I'm the um, uh, founder of uh, Kuna Exchange. It's a Ukrainian uh, first crypto startup. But now my primary research is the uh, future of governance and the network states. Because um, me as an exchange, I felt that you can grow up to a level when you touch the government. Once you touch the government, that's it. You understand that unless they allow you to do something, you know, the destiny is basically uh, there. So the only way you can grow further to become the government yourself. That's what we do. Thanks, everyone. Um, so I was interested to start the panel just maybe to reflect on current affairs, especially with the Frenchman on the panel. Um, Macron calling to, you know, for snap elections and the result of the EU elections, as was expected with more seats for the far right. What does that all mean for crypto? Uh, maybe just a few, a few words. This is an interesting moment, apart from the political side of France, and uh, we are not making, I won't do any politics here, but Macron has always been a, a true supporter of the true a supporter of the crypto economy, the crypto ecosystem. He wanted or still wants for France to be the crypto hub in Europe. Uh, having said that, uh, the current uh, situation in France and the announcement of yesterday for a new election can change everything. Uh, this is exactly what we were discussing. Uh, I would say Macron's, will Macron's in heritage survive to a new government? with uh, other, uh, I would say, engagement with other countries in the world. This is a real question. And uh, he has made some positive move uh, in France for the ecosystem. I'm not talking about regular, uh, regulation, etc., which is still, still ongoing or work in progress. But hopefully, uh, it won't change all the strategy. It would be, I would say, it would be too late, hopefully. But uh, I would be, uh, I don't want to, I don't want to lie here, but uh, the one who will say tomorrow what will be the crypto ecosystem in France tomorrow because of that new election, I think he's not born already, but uh, we don't know. 
Yeah, uh, I think it's a, it's an interesting question also because it's uh, it's not so much known what the let's say political plans of all the um, different parties in in the European Parliament is going to be when it comes to crypto. But at least my interpretation as being like a non political person. Um, so first, um, the, the libertarians lost uh, lost some voices, um, I think, which definitely will have an effect. So I'm, I'm from Germany, and I can definitely say that uh, the libertarians uh, in Germany have been pretty helpful when it came to, to crypto regulation, especially um, due to Ministry of Finance is uh, kind of owned by the libertarians in Germany. And um, so we got a lot of support, and we got a lot of influence also when it came to, to uh, crypto taxation and so on. They changed something that the uh, government before um, was introducing and so on so this uh, this might have an effect but there's also another one because um, so we now see this shift to the right uh, which um, I think many of us uh, see like very critical and are a little bit uh, sad about this I'm, I must also say um, but let's try to see the good and the bad. Um, so um, the, especially the right parties are also a little bit against um, more regulation and especially when it comes to seeing things more on the, on the national, national level and uh, also trying to pull more kind of decision power back to the, to the national governments. So this uh, at least could eventually, and now looking at uh, Tomaso as well, um, to maybe um, having uh, like a lower pace when it comes to, to DeFi regulation and um, being introduced, because um, um, so there might be a little bit more wind from ahead when it comes to, um, to, to introducing more regulation. But on the other side, and that's from my point of view, the flip side as well, um, regulation can also really help to drive market adoption. So uh, Mika really will help um, at least the centralized crypto finance, um, uh, the crypto, um, uh, the centralized finance crypto businesses to expand all over Europe and uh, do this in a very fast way. So therefore, there's always a, a good and a bad. I guess I sort of liked things much better when the governments were not paying any attention to what we were doing in blockchain and crypto. Um, everybody talks about wanting regulatory clarity, and I think having regulatory clarity is overall a good thing. But everybody forgets that when you get regulatory clarity, you have a lot of work to do because you've been living in one world and now all of a sudden you have to live in a world where there's regulatory clarity and uh, that's not always the best thing. Um, as you all probably heard from Joe Lubin's remarks at the beginning, uh, there's a lot of craziness going on in the U.S. about what's regulated and what's not regulated, when tokens are securities under the SEC jurisdiction versus not. I think thankfully things are much simpler here in Europe, so that, that's a, a big positive. Um, but to me, the key issues are the issues that were behind the original Satoshi White Paper and behind a lot of the work that a lot of us have been doing since then, which is how do we create more freedom for people? How do we create more freedom on the internet for people? How do we create a better architecture for the internet and one that allows for that freedom? Um, and so I don't know necessarily whether the right parties or the left parties are going to create more or less freedom. I think that's a very open question. Um, the right parties tend to say that they are less about regulation, but they don't always seem to live by those standards. So I think it's very much an open question and from my perspective, being more focused on what we can do from the, with, with the technology, how we can use technologies to create more freedom is what we should all be thinking about. Um, I'd like to engage the audience if you don't mind. Please. Can you raise your hand if you know what's Mika? Okay, what do you think? What's the, what's the statistics uh, uh, here? Um, big majority. Surprisingly. You think 60% know what's a Mika, right? Oh, I'm not right? good with numbers, that's for can, you guys. Can you raise, raise, raise your hands again, please? Yeah, I'd say about 60%, right. Okay, um, second question. Do you think it's good or bad? I know it's, like, arguable, but, I mean, whether but you're for You need Mika, one question. Is it good? Raise your hand good? if it's good. And now raise your hand if it's bad. And the rest have no clue. <laughs> Um, my opinion is pretty much uh, similar to yours. So we are sitting in a beautiful room, surrounded by the culture, and uh, just let's try to uh, imaginely go back to that time. There was no regulation, there was no Mika, 
there was no passport. There was no border, probably, if it's before the 18th century, it probably is. And uh, we somehow happen to have these cultural masterpieces, right? Without any regulation. Same goes for crypto. Before, and same goes, well, crypto is a part of finance, but before 9-11, we had no regulation. I, I remember, literally, I remember that we came to the Swiss bank with my, fr with my father, showed up with cash, and did, they just took that cash. That was in 98. You cannot do it anymore. And somehow, we still survive. But we, now we have to comply with some new rules and regulations. I'm not saying they're all bad. I'm just saying that regulation is not always the good thing. You have to be very careful because, referring back to my um, colleague here, we are talking about freedoms. And fundamental uh, freedoms are in Europe are four of them, yeah? Freedom of movement freedom of finance, freedom of speech, and the fourth one I forgot was, you see, yeah, I even forgot the freedoms because we're losing them. I've got one comment. Uh, I may be too old compared to you, but what I can say about regulation, I don't, I don't, feel, I don't feel that we need to over-regulate. The problem is to reinvent something. And I think the major, yeah, the, the biggest problem is to, re, to reinvent. But without any regulation, you've got the advantage, maybe compared to many people in this room, but many people in France and over the world, you have the knowledge. But if we want to go for mass adoption, and this is what we are all looking at, I guess. I get that we are all looking at mass adoption in the crypto ecosystem. You need to make people, people who does not know, who has not your knowledge, you need to make them comfortable. And the way to make them comfortable is to feel that they are secured. And regulation helps people feeling being secured. Then this is, in fact, we are at the crossroad. If we are going too far, regulation is going to kill the ecosystem. But if we are too low in the regulatory space, People, there won't be any mass adoption. And at the end, everybody is losing. And this is the extreme, exactly what happened in France. This is the extreme. As soon as you're going too far on one, one way, we are all losing. And also just to add one, one quick one, um, I, would, I would also say that, um, I think freedom is something that we all want to have, right? But uh, what does it exactly mean? So, um, so because also what you gave that example with the bank, and um, so we also all know that in the 70s and in the 80s there have been whatever the mafia clans, whatever washing money and so on and so forth, the banks played an important role for that and therefore certain rules were introduced. So the, the question is like, does freedom mean that everyone can do what you like and we don't have like any, uh, any laws? So, so I think we like I think laws are also protecting the freedom. So so therefore, um, it's always the question where where we find uh, where we find the right mix about this. Let me jump in maybe before we get too philosophical, um, and um, maybe we can redirect the conversation also to reflect on the fact that um, regulation and also financial crime has been a huge kind of shaper of the narrative surrounding crypto. Uh, I think just in the past year we've you know been following the so stories of. FTX, Sam Bankman-Fried, um, Changpeng Zhao, these people are now in prison, um, billions of uh, you know, dollars lost, millions of customers affected. Um, Tornado Cash is another big you know, uh, set of prosecutions which are shaping the way DeFi and open source coding is in, you know, in conjunction with law. Um, so with all of these kind of cases, slowly wrapping up or you know becoming more maybe on the later end of the story do you think that these narratives that um you know finance and crypto go and uh, sorry that crime and crypto go hand in hand are we reaching the end of that story or what you know that's one thing to reflect on and the other question i have is what do tech providers and you know web3 builders what can you learn from you know these cases what how have you changed your strategy I will do it quickly in order to... I think that work is paying. I really feel that work is paying. And we have seen, um, I would say, the collaborative work, the blockchain work, in fact, and everything is linked. But on the past year, we have seen a huge decrease in illicit activities. 
And likewise, I would say every technology evolution, the first to jump in, I'm not sure that I was the first man having a mobile phone, but I'm sure that cartel people or drug dealers were the ones. And everybody is jumping on new technologies. This is what happened. But on the past year, we've seen a decrease, a massive decrease in 2022. Uh, I think that the global illicit activities on blockchain, I think every activities could be child abuse, ransomware, acts, etc. It was, it was worse in 2022, 40 billions. In 2023, it decreased to 25 billions. It's showing that things are moving forward quite quickly. Of course, there are some space which are not, there are still a, the hype on ransomware, on big game, etc. This is quite huge. In the DeFi, where it has been, I would say, the biggest year in 2022 about DeFi acts, and of course, there were all the Northern Korean activities were a big part of DeFi uh, acts and uh, I would say hacking the bridges. But in 2023, it decreased by 54% to less than 600, billion, uh, 600 million, which is huge. It means that the collaborative works, the understanding work, meaning by private sector, I would say all the ecosystem, the crypto ecosystem, the law enforcement, companies like Chainalysis, regulators, the work is in progress, but it's working. We see a very huge decrease. And when I say huge decrease, the overall illicit activity compared to the, I would say, the full flow in crypto businesses, this is less than 0.34% of the activity. Compared to fiat illicit activities, I think that we are in good shape in the crypto ecosystem and the work is progressing. Yeah, well, I, I think, um, so it, it's, it's like always, that right? there's, there's a means of exchange and, um, and people, people discover to, to use it for whatever purpose, for, for the good ones and for the bad ones, also like, like you said earlier. And um, I think when it comes to crypto, of course, the, the scalability of uh, kind of like really moving funds and, and money across the globe kind of uh, is... Uh, kind of like increased much more than like with any other technology or means of exchange that we've seen before. And, um, and I think so also over time we need to think about like, okay, so th there can be different futures, right? Um, so there, the, and so the one that I currently see happening that I also really don't like is that um, the decentralized world is getting mapped into the centralized world. So because there's rules around whatever AML uh, protection and, um, and different compliance uh, things, and um, these rules from the centralized world now get mapped to the decentralized world and to some extent really don't work the same way. And, uh, and on the other side, and now the technical person also speaking out of myself, is um, that there is, from my point of view, really ways of doing things better. Because I think the default for everyone needs to be kind of being f uh, catching up the term freedom again to be kind of like anonymous per default, yeah? So kind of, um, so I have, I, I didn't do anything wrong, I didn't do anything criminal, um, so like with cash, I can give the cash to somebody else and, and that's totally fine. So that should be the default for everyone. But in case I vulnerate some laws and in the end I live in a certain region and I whatever consume certain universities or school and kindergartens and so on and so forth, I think I'm, everyone is mapped into some legal system somewhere. And um, so if I violate laws, then kind of, um, so I need to g become a little bit more visible because I think the, the, the truth is, um, so if things continue like they go right now, everything gets mapped into the centralized world and I think that's not good for, for crypto and for DeFi and, and all, the, all the related technologies and therefore we need to be a little bit more creative out of, the, out of the industry from my point of view as well, whatever there is, all the developments around digital identities and um, blockchain is the most transparent uh, financial system that we've ever had, uh, we can really make use of it and, um, and therefore, uh, yeah, so I, I really believe that um, this approach needs to come from the industry and really show how to make things better than, uh, than uh, the centralized world. A couple of points. Uh, I, by and large, agree with everything that uh, Francois and Peter said. Uh, I will say, though, that um, the whole narrative that blockchain is about finance is wrong, right? Blockchain, sure, has financial applications. It is useful for financial instruments. But we see so many other things happening in blockchain now. Um, digital art, 
is just one very small example. Event ticketing is another very small example. The, the world is recognizing the usefulness of blockchains as sort of database technologies or infrastructure technologies. So if we continue to talk about blockchain as being financial technology, I think we, we lose the message and, uh, uh, and that's a bad thing. Uh, I'm also just exhausted by all of this crypto is for criminal stuff. I, I, you know, we hear this all the time from regulators and policymakers um, and this idea that everybody who's working in the, in the space is some kind of a criminal. Uh, you know, come and arrest me if you think I'm a criminal, but don't run around the world telling everybody that I'm a criminal just because I work at a blockchain company. It's just, just factually inaccurate. Uh, and the last point I'd like to make is uh, in, in line with what Francois was saying about the great decrease in the amount of financial crime that's being perpetrated with blockchains, to my mind, that's because as more good actors come into the space, they push out the bad actors. They marginalize the bad actors. We see that happen time and time again in the economy in all different sectors. And if regulators and policymakers would spend a little bit more time thinking about how to incentivize the good actors through things like workable regulation, by the way, um, that would be a much better goal than just walking around telling us that we're all criminals. Do you have any last thoughts? Um, yeah. Or maybe we, if you are able to also say how, as, a, you know, as an exchange, you've had to adapt to certain regulations or what your take is um, in the way you've had to navigate these, these changes. Um, that's the issue that everyone has to solve before the 1st of January. But um, I'd like to discuss something more important. So the whole notion of, of laws and, uh, and regulation. So apparently to Mika, the, uh, the crypto sphere or blockchain sphere will become more secure for the, for the people. But I'd like to um, think of how we learn as, a, as, a, as a humans here. Yeah? So we grow up, if you're lucky, in the families. And then we lead by example of our parents, right? I mean... I'm a parent, I cannot imagine that I come back home and uh, tell my kid, here is the constitution, here is the rules that you have to abide. No, it doesn't work like that. It's, 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 a, it's a natural process. Same goes here. So if we create over strict rules like Mika is trying to create, uh, what's gonna do? That's just basically just kill all the European businesses. For example, France, we're in Paris. If you want to legally be a migrant here, it's inc incredibly hard. I'm Ukrainian, so I know that perfect on myself. But if you just go this step of illegal immigrant, everything is very simple. You just come here, and the government will give you everything you need. And they will give you documents and everything, and you just did it the legal way, but you received the, uh, the documents. If I do it legally, I cannot do it. So we see the problem of that f thing, yeah? Second, I said about the uh, children, that you cannot enforce something, you have to lead by example. So there is no point, uh, you know, creating some in extreme rules that will only uh, hurt the um, European companies for the rest of the world. And I want to say that that's like majority of the world, yeah, they don't have Mika regulation. So people in Asia, in Africa, in Middle East, in Latin America, in Canada, even in US, they don't care about the Mika because they have their own rules or they don't have the rules at all. So what's gonna happen? All the Asian crypto exchanges, going back to your question with the exchanges, I, I'm, I'm scared more of um, um, that with the, with the path of this meek and, and strict regulations in Europe, it's not only about crypto, it's about everything, yeah? They're trying to you know, block every single move. We're gonna go into the path where we just lose all the uh, um, credibility and all the competitive advantage. This is what I'm worried about because the, the rest of the world, they don't have any rules. They need to survive. And when people need to survive, they don't care about anything. That's the problem that we should tackle. And, uh, and also adding to this, I think the Mika, um, on the one hand, 
has the, has the goal to introduce a crypto regulation and make things kind of or harmonize things inside the EU. But from my point of view, it's also kind of like a market protection for the European market. So kind of with all these rules, whatever US companies need to open like a department in, inside the EU and so on and so forth. And I think that's uh, kind of also, again, the two-sided sword here, right? Um, on the one hand, um, having common standards. And I would say like the more global they are, the better. Because um, so what we want to have in the future is like a like a, a finance system, a global one that uh, that works like the internet, right? So I can send information across the globe, it's super easy. In current finance, it's not possible. In crypto finance, at the moment, it's possible. But when every jurisdiction, every country, every economic zone is introducing their own rules and they are not compatible to each other, so we get like a new financial system that runs on a new technology but is as bad as the old one. And and therefore, I think um, it's it's important, kind of, there needs to be some harmonization but um, these, introduction, uh, these, uh, these introductions of, um, of regulation shouldn't be used uh, to protect markets because then it leads the wrong way. And just following on, on Peter's point, um, the, the internet is automatically global. Everything that happens on blockchain is automatically global. So this idea that we have to have very specific regulations, jurisdiction by jurisdiction, is also unrealistic. Um, you know, trying to say that French people have to act a certain way uh, on a decentralized network on the internet it, versus the way Americans act, versus the way Ukrainians act, versus the way Germans act, versus the way p people in Japan act, it's just not realistic. That said, that's in the decentralized world. In the centralized world, there can be standards, and to Michael's point, making sure that those standards are workable for everybody, not too restrictive, uh, but still providing a minimum level of protection uh, from bad actors like SBF and, and others, you know, that makes a lot of sense. I've got a question for you and thank you, but it was very relevant, but I think we are facing the first problem. The first problem with regulators is that all over the world, and I fully agree with you, Leon. How do you want to, to make different jurisdiction for something which is global? Something which is difficult to hear, difficult to understand, but more than everything, there is no common de definition, legal definition of ownership in the, crispo, in the crypto space. Then where there is no legal definition of what is ownership, how do you want to qualify something which has been theft or something like this? Then we are trying to regulate something which is not defined legally, and at the end, I guess it can't finish on something positive. Because the first thing, which is the definition of what we are going to regulate, is not common, and in some countries, like in France, it's not even defined. Then this is a, but this is a question for you. Well, I, I would go go on it first. Um, yeah, I think that's also the part of the complication because, um, so for example, when in, in Germany the um, crypto Wertpapier Gesetz, so kind of the digital securities law, was introduced, I think two and a half years ago, um, it also had like a, I think that the biggest work that they invested um, was to change also certain things like in the in the civil law, or whatever, to um, to make like a like a thing something digital as well because the thing was 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 physical before and kind of after this uh, law change a, a thing could also be something digital and then kind of if a thing is also something digital you can also lose it you can get it in the heritage and whatever you have some uh, some warranty rights on on it and so on and this is kind of um, eventually also the the complication so if we want to introduce kind of like a, a term of a terminology of ownership globally so there's probably whatever 250 different laws to be changed uh, also on that level and i think that that makes it complicated and actually one one thing that i want, also wanted to, to say before is like again with the internet i think the internet was super lucky that um, 35 years back nobody had a clue what the effect could be of the internet yeah so the, the implications and kind of that it would change like industries and whatever old companies go bankrupt because like they missed the change to the internet and to the digital economy i think this was the big luck for for the internet because otherwise we would have a french internet a german internet a u.s internet and everyone would try to push their uh, kind of uh, yeah their, their rules into, into the system and um, then we would stand at a completely different point today 
Yeah, that's an interesting thought. Um, you know, so that would be one blockchain to rule them all, or? <laughs> there's no chance that that will happen. There's, there's going to be continuous innovation. And as people keep innovating on blockchains, old blockchains will still be useful and will still be used by their communities and newer blockchains will come and are, they'll be used by their communities. So no one blockchain to rule them all, just like there's sort of not really one internet to rule them all. That's the beauty of decentralization is that different people can do different things within, within the internet uh, in, in a way that's not possible in the physical world. So I think also what we're seeing in the past few years is a shift from governments, from regulators, um, also looking into other Web3-esque concepts like digital identities, digital wallets. Um, I know the EU recently passed and has officially made law a digital identity framework. Um, there is even mention of zero knowledge proof in the legislation. So. Um, what, what is the potential of this? Do you think that um, there will be another private-public partnership to help you know, re recreate what we think of identities at a governmental level? Or is this something that you know, is, is an industry business alone? The, the trend here is the fourth, it's called fourth industrial revolution. But in essence, it's the um, uh, concept of the network state. So in the next five years, we're going to see the new so-called government bodies, fully digital, which uh, will only operate in your smartphone. By the way, if you look at your statistics on your phone, I highly suggest you do that. How many hours you spend online? So this is your, uh, um, you're present at that time, not here in this world, you're present in the digital world. So there will be governments which will uh, take care of you much better than the current governments. So for example, Apple is already taking care of your health. It's monitoring everything, it's storing everything, well in some jurisdictions obviously, but it's already doing it. OpenAI is much better assistant than I have a physical one. Um, Microsoft, Google, all these huge corporations, they're gonna take, uh, take care of the people. And once they accumulate the critical mass, they will just say, we are the new government. So this is the future. This is the future that is being discussed in Davos. We're going to see a lot of it in, uh, <coughs> sorry, this coming up um, uh, January. There will be uh, a lot of AI-based uh, network states, uh, which will dominate. So um, therefore, the problem of uh, even trying to regulate something uh, as the analog country will just doesn't exist in, in a few years because everything will be digital and will be connected through digital IDs, digital, wherever everything is, is digital. I actually have a slightly different view, uh, although I agree with a lot of what you said, Michael. I think we're moving into a bifurcated world. We're moving into a world where uh, you will have the ability, I think we're already basically here, you will have the ability to be digital in the network state, but you'll also have the ability to be digital in the decentralized world. And that bifurcation is going to create interesting possibilities for people and their ability to control the things that they do. Uh, you may make decisions. I want to engage in certain activities in the network state, and I want to engage in other activities in the decentralized state. Um, but to your point about the large companies, to the extent that you give over your control to the large companies, obviously that's an area where regulation could be targeted. Rather than targeting what you do in the decentralized world when it's you doing those actions by yourself, targeting the companies that are facilitating what you do in the decentralized world is a place where regulation, to my mind, makes more sense. Yeah, and um, also what I think we're already seeing for, for the past couple of years, like step by step, but I think now it's getting really obvious, is kind of um, that uh, things are going in a direction that kind of these both states like li live right next to each other. So let's say the traditional state and the network state, 
and kind of the, the ways to interact in between each other, so kind of the bridges in between, will get like lower and lower all the time. So because, um, so as in the end, uh, introduction, uh, like regulation is in, especially introduced with the centralized companies, for example, Mika here in the EU. Um, so um, all the crypto exchanges that I can use as a fiat on-ramp and so on and so forth, that and in the end, the fiat on-ramp is my bridge into the, into the digital world. Um, of DeFi and so on, and kind of if those are regulated and kind of uh, regulation is pushed to them, so for example, whatever certain certain things happen in DeFi world uh, that should be blocked or somebody decides that should be blocked, then whatever there are whitelists and uh, kind of these and these bridges go away, and and therefore so I really. I, I see the community going this direction like, oh, come on, so they should come and regulate us. We are unstoppable. Um, the technology can't be stopped and so on and so forth. That's totally true. But in the, what can happen is that kind of we dry out in liquidity um, because kind of these bridges are burned. And, and therefore, I think there is only that one way that we can do now. So kind of try to move both parts together. So kind of the, the network state and the traditional state need to be one thing, kind of when the people decide kind of in what I, I want to lift. And in the end, I'm, I'm rooted in a certain region. I have the kindergarten there um, and I go to university and so on, uh, pay my taxes and so on. Okay, so that's... That's still the, the world for, for most of the people. And um, I think the biggest benefit for, for, the, for the decentralized world would be if we find solutions together and kind of what you, what you quoted with um, digital identities and so on. I think that those are the tools and solutions kind of on the one hand to keep the technology as it is right now and with DeFi the same it is, but make it more powerful because everyone, everyone could reach it. Do you have any final words? I'm thinking maybe to ask if anyone has a question from the audience, we could take maybe one or two questions if anyone has a burning. Actually, while you are thinking about a question, um, I, one, one addition, because you also said um, um, public-private partnerships and uh, also to criticize one thing. So we, we for example, tried um, to um, become part of the suppliers for the digital euro or at least looked into it and kind of signed up for the SAP, net, uh, SAP uh, platform, <laughs> procurement platform of, of ECB and so on. And... Um, but in the end, kind of, um, this, like, only big company, corporations are able to take part of this. Whatever is 300, uh, three-digit million uh, revenue and whatever. Um, so, and in the end, especially the innovators from, from, the, from the blockchain space, from the crypto space, especially the young people at the university who are like, really driving crazy technology, they are not even able to apply to those tenders. And, uh, and I think in the end, um, so when Amazon and so on are taking over um, to build this innovation, I think it also goes in the wrong direction. Please raise your hand if there's anything, anyone. Um, I'll come to you. Is that okay? Well, thank you very much. I just wanted to like, disagree a little bit with you when it comes to the innovation and, and the market, uh, when it comes to the regulation. Uh, with some of you, I agree, because if you don't have rules, then maybe you go faster on the market, but then you cannot adapt at, on the large scale. I um, just want to inform, in, in a sense, that if we combine self sovereign identity and other technologies, maybe we can have easy KIC. So then, then we don't resolve the issue of anonymity and, and other stuff. For your companies and for your action, to which extent you have uh, adapted already the regulation? So what are your concrete actions? Besides mentioning the legal part, Mika and other regulation, what you have done in terms that the user can trust you, your services, and, and the related uh, action that you, they might exploit your platform to take? Um, so it's still half a year for the uh, finals, and because some of the regulators still have no clue what the hell is Mika and what exactly has to be regulated unfortunately that's that's true so that goes for the smaller countries and uh, in terms of uh, protecting the customers I'm on the market for more than 10 years they trust me more than any government well um, I, I think um, of, of course like regulation can kind of like try to force um, to uh, try to force kind of like uh, people to trust you kind of like by com committing to rules but still so I think um, so there's there's so much more than than just regulation. So, for example, I, I thought about um, kind of um, 
So what would be the components to, to bring DeFi to the masses already a few years back? And uh, from my point of view, it's not necessarily regulation that uh, makes it more trustworthy. It's all these kind of like tiny aspects around like, um, okay, so for example, if my mother invests into DeFi, she, she loses money because of a technical mistake. So kind of who can I whatever blame for this, right? So kind of the, our world w w works like this, that there's somebody responsible. And um, so we, we could... Uh, for example, if, if there would be some sort of like, let's say, decentralized uh, legal entity, yeah, so kind of like a, whatever um, a corporate cooperative that, uh, like, in a digital way, so that it could at least give some some legal clarity about it. Or maybe there's like a liability umbrella, so like a DeFi liability umbrella, so that can uh, jump in for for such stuff. But I think all these things are are currently missing, and therefore I think the the political uh, consent is always going like, okay, so we have to introduce these rules and, and, uh, and then they find orientation from the centralized ones and then we get rules that we don't like. I think it's really about um, yeah, really finding the creative solutions and, and there's maybe, maybe more that we can do as a community than we think. Just very quickly, uh, part, part of the way that people begin to trust organizations or even trust other people is their reputation. And uh, to Michael's point, if somebody's been around for a long time and develops a good reputation for uh, honesty and trustworthiness, then you, you get the benefit of that. Part of what you get in the decentralized world is trusting code rather than people, but still people write the code, people audit the code, and there have been exploits and other problems with bridges and DeFi protocols and other things. So again, it's often a question of how quickly are you going to get involved. If you decide you're going to be a first mover, uh, in other words, uh, somebody who's going to use a platform at the beginning, you're probably taking more risk because not as many people have tested it out. If lots of people have tested it out and you see the result is that everybody's satisfied, then you probably have a better chance of being okay. But this question of who you can trust and when you can trust, it's really more about uh, the experience that many people have had as opposed to just looking at an individual situation uh, at the beginning. Yeah, if you've... I think the, to answer your question, collaboration is key to give trust. And you've got legitimacy, legitimacy etc. You've got what we are trying to achieve and as a company and to help, we have been leading that can and we are working with some people here in the room but we are trying to bring transparency or privacy through transparency or transparency through privacy. And today, there are ways to counter strike on illicit activities and to help the ecosystem behaving better. The problem we face from regulatory or regulators, etc., this is somehow a lack of knowledge. And when you lack of knowledge, you're trying to do everything to cover. But we've got the data, we share the data, and if we collaborate well, we give the company, the, the ecosystem, the crypto ecosystem, the ability to manage, I would say, compliance, regulation, I would say by, by risk. This is a risk who is driving your business. We give the data and we give the ability for those companies to share quickly information with all the stakeholders who will protect the consumers and help having the right answer to that kind of activities. But this is, this is a collective effort. And this is what we are all trying to achieve. And this is what brings trust to legitimacy and trust. Thank you very much. Our time is up. We're kindly being ushered for the next, uh, the next panel. So thanks so much. And thanks for your questions as well. Thank you so much to our speakers. That was a really enlightening conversation. And again, for our speakers, if you can Head towards the back for anyone that has any questions into the hall, and that way we'll keep the noise down.